here at, at Temple Terrace. What a great day that it is to be able to, to meet together in, in unity and worship our Lord. Uh, this morning we might have some, some visitors, whether that's, that's via live stream or, or here in person. We want to thank you very much for being here with us to worship our Lord together. If you are here in person, we would very much like to get to know you a little bit better. So if you would, please stick around at the end of services. A lot of us will, will either be here in the auditorium or in the, the foyer area. Again, we would really like to, to get to know you. This morning, just like every other Lord's Day morning, Sunday morning, we're going to be gathering here to worship God. And how do we know how to worship God but to look at the scriptures? It talks about New Testament Christians were continuing the apostles' teachings uh, while they were there worshiping. So what are those teachings? We, we see that, that there is scripture reading where they, they are meeting together to, to read scripture. They're also meeting together to pray together, to uh, sing songs, singing with one another to make uh, grace in their hearts to the Lord. And then also we're, we're seeing that, that there, were, there was preaching done where, where they would be, uh, men would be speaking uh, a portion of the, the Bible in order to, to know what we are supposed to be doing, what God wants us to be doing. Well, this morning we'll have two different uh, lessons brought to us, one being the, the communion meditation, where we, we gather together to, to break the, the bread and to drink the, the cup in memory of, of Christ. And then we'll have the, the sermon by dawn this morning. But before we get, get going and have our, our scripture reading, let's go to our God and Father in prayer. Our Lord and Father, we thank you so much for this Lord's Day, this day that we can come together and worship you. Lord, we thank you so much for this group that we are able to, to meet here without the, the fear of outside harm, that we can meet together and worship you in the way that, that you would have us to be worshiping you. Please help us as we're going through this morning that we would be worshiping you in the way that you would have us to, that it would be a sweet-smelling aroma to you, that you would enjoy our, our worship. Lord, thank you so much for, for this church family that we are able to, to meet with one another, but please help us to, to be encouraged this morning and to encourage each other and then to encourage the, the people that are that are out in the world around us. Please help us, Lord, to, to spread your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for so many other things, but this morning, Lord, please help us to, to focus on, on what we are, are praying, what we are singing, and what we are listening to, to, to better be, be worshipful to you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, so great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. Good morning. The first song we'll sing this morning is our mother, our Jesus. <laughs> no soul, I know.
next one we'll see is O magnify my eyes.
Well, good morning to you all. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn to Psalm number 8, the 8th Psalm. Here in this church family, if you're new or visiting with us, we partake of the Lord's Supper every single Sunday, not just on Easter, because His death, His sacrifice, it changes the way we live, and we want to constantly remember that. We want to constantly honor Him, because that's what He's asked for. The eighth psalm is going to direct our thoughts in doing that this morning. Psalm number eight says this. O Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you, take, that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, a little lower than the angels, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The eighth psalm is a song about the glory of God and the dignity of man. It is a song of thanksgiving which praises God and gives thanks for him for making us, mankind, the crown of his creation. David makes his point by establishing a hierarchy of mankind and created beings. He shows us where we stand in relation to all the other things that God has created And so he says, we rule over the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea. We have dominion over the sheep and the oxen and all the creeping beasts. We command and dominate all the works of God's hands. And he also says this in verse 5. He says, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? You have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. That's another statement about the glorified position of man. We are just a little lower than the angels. And that really is a remarkable thought. What a wonderful thought that we are a little lower than the angels. The angels are, are, are amazing beings to think about. And if you read what the Bible says about them, you'll you'll, you'll be amazed by what, what it says, how remarkable it is. Angels shine and amaze and terrify. They send armies to flight and they win battles single handedly. The Bible tells us that in one night, one angel struck down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers to save God's people. Another story tells us that one angel. One angel blinded an entire army to save God's prophet. And when we read the account of the resurrection, we learn that an angel appeared and rolled the stone away and terrified the soldiers that guarded the tomb of Jesus. Angels are amazing beings who dwell every single day in the presence of God without fear of death. And David says, us, mankind, we are just a little bit lower than the angels. And that speaks to the glory that God has crowned us with. But the Bible has more to say about angels. Despite their great power and their amazing abilities, none would, none would disagree that, that they are nothing compared to God himself. They do not create, but they are created. And they are infinitely inferior to God, His Spirit, and His Son. They do not possess the perfect qualities of God. The book of Jude tells us that angels are capable of sinning and disappointing God. Colossians 2 tells us that angels are not worthy of our worship. Get this one. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that we will judge angels. If you understand that, you let me know, because I don't. 
And go ahead and turn to the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 1, we're told several things about angels. We learn that, that no angel has ever been called a child of God. No angel has been treated in the way that Jesus was treated or, frankly, that you and I are treated. And we also learn in Hebrews chapter 1 that they are, they are merely ministering spirits. That God sends out his angels as servants so that they can serve us and serve him. As spectacular as angels may be from our perspective, from the perspective of God... They are simply faithful servants who do as their master commands and go where he tells them. Now, having said all of that, it's for that reason that the message of Hebrews chapter 2 should mean so much to us. In Hebrews chapter 2, the writer, the writer quotes Psalm 8. He quotes this verse where he talks about being made a little bit lower than the angels, but he does so to emphasize a different point. You see, David wrote the eighth psalm because he wanted men to understand what a glory we have been crowned with being made only a little lower than the angels. But Hebrews 2, the writer quotes Psalm 8 because he wants us to understand the humility of Jesus by being willing to make himself a little bit lower than the angels. Look at what it says, Hebrews 2 and verse 6. But one has testified somewhere saying, what is, men that you are, what is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see him who was made a little while Lower than the angels, Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The writer says, it is amazing, it is amazing that men have been made a little bit lower than the angels, but it is more amazing that God himself, Jesus Christ, was willing to take on flesh and become himself for a little while lower than the angels. How often do we consider what an amazing thing it is that God put on flesh to dwell among us? God incarnate. As we read in the letter to the Philippians, Paul tells us that, that Christ emptied himself. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, grasped something to be held on to. It was not something he was unwilling to relinquish. God put on flesh. He made himself into a lowly man. In that thought, the idea of God making himself lower than his angels, it was so tremendous and so outrageous that Paul says in the Corinthian letters that the Gentiles thought it was ridiculous. The pagans looked at the idea of a God making himself lower than his angels and they said that's foolishness. What kind of God would do that? From our perspective, it's ridiculous that God would make himself weak and take on the form and the image and the likeness of his creation. But perhaps we find that foolish as men because we don't love the way that he loves. As you consider the fact that Jesus made himself lower than his angels, as you consider the fact that he took on flesh to become like us, ask yourself the question, are you willing to lower yourself for the sake of others? What would you let go of? What honors and dignities and privileges would you let go of in your life to help other people? We're all sitting here this morning on Easter Sunday in our very nicest clothes, aren't we? Would you trade your clothes in for filthy rags and go about in this earth wearing that for the sake of helping others? Would you give up your nice 
cushy office job and go do menial labor for the sake of others? Would you give up your house with all of its luxuries and all of its carpet or wood floors or tile and air conditioning and go live in a shack for the sake of others? Would you give up your pride and make yourself the servant of the lowliest person walking on this earth? To be sure, to be sure, Jesus has not commanded that we do that. But that's not the point. The point is that Jesus had to do that to save us. He had to do that and so much more by leaving the glory of heaven, by leaving the throne of God and taking on weak flesh like us. He let go of so much glory and so much ease and so much comfort and he did that because it was the only way he possibly could help us. For us, he made himself for a moment even a little lower than the angels. The life and death of Jesus on the cross is a great testament to his humility. And his humility is a great testament to his endless love for you and me. And today, we partake of bread. Bread which represents a real body, an incarnate God. A God who took on a lowly and broken existence to save us. And today we partake of the fruit of the vine which represents his blood, real blood, which he took on and he shed for us. As we partake, let us remember that God became flesh and dwelt among us. And that that was no small thing. For our sakes, he became a little lower than the angels. Let us pray for the bread. Dear Lord our God, we thank you for everything you gave and everything you suffered for our sake. What an amazing thing it is that you sent your son Jesus to live in the flesh like us and to suffer like us and to be weak like us so that one day we may be glorified with you. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for his life. In his name we pray. Amen. Let us give thanks for the cup. O Lord our God, when we consider the fruit of the vine which represents your blood, we are called back to remember the death of your son Jesus on the cross and the terrible suffering that he endured. Lord, we're mindful of the fact that he suffered for our sins and the pain he endured was not something that he deserved that it was something that we deserved. Thank you so much for your son. 
and for his shed blood. We thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. What an amazing thought it is that God took on flesh. He took on our flesh and he dwelt among us. That demonstrates amazing humility. And as Paul said again, such humility was considered foolishness to the people of this world. Let it be, let it be that your humility is considered foolish by the people who see you walk around every single day. Let it be that the case that the humility you display is considered outrageous, just like his was to the people of this world. His death, his death not only brings us salvation, but it calls us to live in this world with the same kind of humility with which he lived. The Lord's Supper is now concluded. And always, as a matter of convenience, we take a moment now to mention the collection that we take every Sunday as well. As if you're a guest here, we're not asking for your money. This is merely a commandment that's given to the members of this church here that we give to promote the Lord's work in this place every single Sunday. And so now let us us say a prayer for the offering. Dear Lord our God, we're mindful of all the tremendous ways that you've blessed us the most important spiritual blessings, but also the physical blessings as well. Lord, we pray that the money we offer you today will be, will be given with a spirit of generosity and that great things, great fruit will be born for your kingdom through it. Lord, thank you so much for everything you give us and please continue to bless us in every way. We cannot live this life without you. In your son's name we pray and ask these things, amen.
give you guys a little bit of context to kind of make it more impactful. I understand that we understand that time. We might not know what day specifically that Jesus rose, but we do celebrate that fact. And we're here gathered because of that. And uh, as the slides mentioned before in Christian Corinthians 15, the fact that Jesus rose gives us a confidence in our faith. And praise be to God for that. And that's why we're doing this song. So let's keep that in mind. see everybody today. Do you have a Bible today? We're going to the 19th division of John's Gospel. John chapter 19 is where we're going to spend all of our time this morning, and we'll ask you to be opening there if you will. And while you're opening your Bibles and getting settled, taking your family report where you can jot a note or two this morning, we certainly welcome all of you, along with the sentiment that was expressed a moment ago. We welcome you to our service this morning. We know we have as is always the case on Sunday, a lot of folks who are visiting with our church family today, and we welcome you. Some of you are from our community, some of you are from other parts of these United States, whatever brings you to us today, we're very grateful for that. We hope you can come and share worship with us again. We always have a lot of folks who visit us via live stream. We know that will be the case today as well, whether they are watching live right now or whether they'll watch this service later today. And for those of you who are with us via that medium, we Welcome you also to our service today. Sure is good to see everybody this morning. Glad that you're with us. Great to see our college students. I know this is a very, very busy time for you. The last two weeks of the uh, semester before finals when uh, so many things coalesce and uh, come, come, uh, come do for you. And we hope that all that goes well for you over the next, next couple of weeks. And great to see some folks in our church family who've been traveling, who are back with us now. Very happy for that as well. 
I'm glad we can be together on this extraordinarily beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day. It was already mentioned this morning that the religious world, of course, today is, is focused on Easter and the resurrection of Jesus. You know, for us, for us, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. For us, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. It's why Sunday is, in fact, the best day, the best day of the week. When something inspiring happens, we, we often say, you know what, wish I could have been there. Wish I could have seen that. I thought about that on Friday when uh, Major League Baseball celebrated the 75th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in baseball and doing that, by the way, in a Dodger uniform, the best baseball franchise ever. And uh, I thought, I, what, it, what would it have been like to be there that day and to see that? Or to be in Berlin and to have heard Ronald Reagan say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Or to be on the mall in Washington, D.C. and hear Martin Luther King and his I Have a Dream speech. Or how about the Bible? If you could go back anywhere in the Bible and see any of those great Bible stories, what, what would you have liked to have seen? Maybe when, uh, maybe when Moses divided the Red Sea, or maybe when David uh, went toe-to-toe and eye-to-eye with a, with a Philistine giant, or maybe when God closed the door of the ark and that 120 years of preparation on the part of Noah was rewarded with the salvation of his life and his family. But I think probably for most of us, of all the events in the Bible uh, of Jesus' life, which, which of those would you have chosen? I mean, if we narrow it down this, just to Jesus, what would you have liked to have seen in the life of Jesus? Maybe Jesus uh, walking on the water, or Jesus curing the incurable. But probably for most of us, probably hands down, probably not even a close second, we would have liked to have seen the stone in the tomb rolled away and Jesus emerge from a place of death. There's something about the resurrection of Jesus that just resonates to the very heart and soul of individuals who are Bible believers because it's a story of, of living hope for those of us who hope to live after this life. The resurrection in so many ways is a centerpiece of Christianity. And so the gospel writers, they, they devote a third of their writing, a third of their writing just to the last week of Jesus' life alone. It's an interesting contrast because really the first 30 years of Jesus' life, all we are given are little bits and pieces, little snippets of speeches that he gave. We are given little, little glimpses of happenings in Jesus' life. But the last week of Jesus' life is given a tremendous amount of attention in the Gospels. Sunday was a day of triumph. It was a day of of a royal entry into the royal city where people would would put palm branches in his way and cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Tuesday was a day of questions, questions trying to trap him and snare him in his words. And yet by the end of that day, the narrative says that, that at this point, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Thursday was a day of betrayal. It is a day when Jesus would eat the Passover supper and would institute the supper that we just observed a moment ago. He would make his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it was there that the events of Judas' betrayal would take place. Friday was a day of crucifixion, the darkest day in human history. But Sunday was a day of resurrection. It was the brightest and best day in human history. Friday to Sunday in so many ways, is a story of a grave to a garden. Because the text says in John 19 and 30 that when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. That is, Jesus died. There's no question about the fact that he died. He died. Let's understand that at the very beginning. Jesus died. It is there that the narrative picks up. Do you have your Bible? John 19, beginning in verse 38. Here's the reading today. John 19, verse 38, beginning after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came. They brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds in weight, and they took the body of Jesus. They bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as is the custom of the Jews, to bury. Now in the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. 
And so there they laid Jesus because the Jews' preparation day and the tomb, the tomb was nearby. That's a narrative with which most in this audience would be eminently familiar, but I want in particular, if you will, to notice verse 41 with me. In the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden there was a tomb in which no one had yet been laid. In the garden there was a tomb. We're not talking here about the Garden of Gethsemane. We're not talking about the Garden of Eden. We are talking about a place, for want of a better term, that it's just a cemetery. It's a cemetery. Just as today, cemeteries often resemble gardens. They have manicured lawns, and they have beautiful trees and fountains of water and ponds and islands of flowers. But the reality is that it's still a cemetery. And above the ground, it may be beautiful, it may be inviting, but we all know that below the surface... It's a place of death. But the place of Jesus' grave was transformed into a garden of hope. And we celebrate the garden of hope. We celebrate the resurrection as well. We should. But before we get there, before we get there, could I just say that we can't ignore the fact that first of all, it was a grave. That before we can talk about the garden of resurrection, it was a grave. Because if we don't appreciate how bad the bad news was, we're never going to appreciate how good the good news is. In Philippians 3 and beginning in verse 10, Paul said, here is what I pray. I pray, he said, that I may know, that I may know the power of our Lord's resurrection and also that I might be conformed to his suffering. Because you can't really experience resurrection power until you've had an experience of suffering. And so again, we have to understand the grave before we can really understand the garden. It's during the times of the grave that individuals say things like, you know what, it, I, I really don't think that this can get any worse, and it's probably not going to get any better. Have you ever said that? Have you ever been in a place in your life, a period of time in your life, where you've just said, you know what, I just don't think this can get any worse, and I really, I really don't believe it's ever going to get any better? I will tell you, that's where the disciples were when Jesus was crucified, because again, what did we say a moment ago? Jesus was dead, and death certificates, ladies and gentlemen, have a way of reinforcing reality. Now, their expectations had been high, but now their rabbi their rabbi was dead. He was decisively dead. He was scourged and crucified dead. He was buried and sealed in a tomb dead. And the point of it is that everything in human experience would say, you don't come back from that. You don't come back from that kind of death. On Sunday morning, the text says, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala, came to the tomb early while it was still dark. The phrase, while it was still dark, is an interesting one because it was dark in the sky, but it was also dark in her heart because the Jesus that Mary knew and loved was dead. It can't get any worse, and it's never going to get any better. Maybe you've been there with that. It's the moment that you learn of the affair. It's the time on Friday when your boss tells, me that he tells you that you will not have a job on Monday. It's when you're sitting in the waiting room and the doctor walks in and you can tell immediately from the look on his face that this is not going to be good. It's the moment when you were in darkness and you, you really don't know if there's ever going to be light again. And I will tell you, if you live long enough, you're going to be there. There are some young people in this audience who haven't experienced that, but I will tell you, there are many in this audience with enough mileage on the odometer of their life that you have been there, either personally or vocationally or spiritually or relationally, you have been there. And in those moments, it's easy to get lost in that season. You see, we read this story about Jesus' resurrection. We, we read about his death. And our minds immediately go to resurrection because we know the end of the story. And so for us, when we read about the crucifixion and Jesus breathes his last and Jesus dies, in our mind, we all know that's going to be okay because immediately we go to the resurrection. But the disciples, ladies and gentlemen, they had to live through Saturday. And on Saturday, there was only darkness. If you're stuck in the darkness of that in-between time in your life, could I just remind you 
that as long as there's time on the clock, there's opportunity for God to work. That as long as you're alive, as long as, as, long as there's time on the clock, there's opportunity for God to work. Because the darkness of crucifixion was not an accident. It was not a miscalculation on God's part. It was not a mistake. It was part of the plan. If you're visiting with us today, <clears throat> in our church family, we sing a song entitled Thomas's Song that asks the question, could this have been part of the plan? And the answer is yes, of course it was. In fact, Jesus, when he had given thanks, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, said, he said, I want you to take and eat this bread because this represents my body, which is broken for you. This was part of the plan, that Christ's body would be broken for you and for me. And so quite simply, before God could give us a future, he had to deal with our past. And so because of that, we know that there is a glimmer of hope. And in fact, the Bible will talk about that. I want to take you to a story in the Old Testament. I don't need you to turn there. Let me just give you the Reader's Digest version here. In the book of Hosea, chapter 2, God is talking about his people, his people Israel, who would, who would live in rebellion to him. And he, and he said on that occasion, I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Achor is a word that means pain, trouble. And God said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring pain and trouble <clears throat> and, and through that pain and trouble, I'm going to offer my people Israel hope. If we were to bring that to the New Testament and broaden the horizon of that a little bit, the pain and trouble that comes into our life as a result of sin. Because the Bible says, the Bible says about that, that the wages of sin is death. In fact, Paul would say in the book of Ephesians 2 that you as God made alive who are dead in your trespasses and sin. The wage of sin is death. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. Paul would say it this way, through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin and death spread to all men because all have sinned. And so that's the pain that was brought into our life. That because all have sinned, there is none righteous, no, not one. The result of that is that we face death. But God would offer us a door a door of hope. And so the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God who is rich in his mercy with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he has made us alive together with Christ. And in Romans 5, if by one man's offense death reigned through the, through the one much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign through the one that is Jesus Christ. And so what God said in the Old Testament is true in the New as well. I will give them the valley of Achor as a door of hope. I'm going to give them pain. The wages of sin is death. And yet I'm going to open in that a door, a door of hope. And somebody says, well, you know, Don, what, what does that have to do with us? Why, why would that even matter? Well, it matters because whatever grave that you may be experiencing right now does not have to be the final word. God says, in every valley of pain, I will give a door of hope. The story of the resurrection of Jesus is to say to us again that as long as there is time on the clock, there is opportunity for God to work. Now, the challenge is that when you're talking about somebody coming back from the dead, that is a pretty tall mountain to climb. How, how are we to come to believe in that? Because I will guarantee you there is nobody in this room who's ever experienced that. None of us have ever buried a parent and had that parent come back to life. There are people in this room who have buried a child, and no matter how hard you prayed, that child did not come back to life. And so how are we to climb the mountain to believe that, in fact, Jesus, Jesus could have come back from the dead? Well, there's a lot of evidence for that. And that's really not the purview of this lesson this morning, but there's a lot of evidence for that. There are, for example, the, the evidence of the empty tomb itself. There is no dispute that the tomb was empty. And then there are the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. But maybe one of the strongest pieces of evidence is 
is that Jesus' followers were willing to die for their faith rather than deny his resurrection. History tells us that followers like Matthew and Mark and Luke and Peter and James were all willing to be killed rather than recant their belief in Jesus' resurrection. It's impossible to believe that these men would have gotten together and said, you know what, we are going to perpetuate this fraud. We are going to, we're going to continue this charade, even if it means that we have to die for this lie. People don't do that. Now, there are a lot of examples of individuals who were willing to die for a truth, but nobody is willing to die for what they know is a lie. And so the disciples didn't just hope that maybe Jesus would come back from the dead. They believed it because they saw it. And the question is, ladies and gentlemen, the question is, have we had a moment, have you and I had a moment where we say with conviction, I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Because I'll tell you, once you have that moment where you believe that, it's not just what you were taught in Sunday school, it's not just what mom and dad want you to believe, but it's your belief. It is in the recesses of your soul that you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. When you believe that, it will change everything. Because if Jesus can defeat death, then what is the situation of your life that he cannot help? It means that there is no personal demon with which, you, with which you struggle. There is no marriage problem with which you grapple. There is no weakness with which you fight. There is no situation that seems insurmountable to you that the Lord is beyond his reach and his help. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he began that great book by saying, let me just tell you from the very beginning what I am praying for you. And he said, here, here is what I pray for you. I pray I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us to believe this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand. In other words, Paul says, I want you to understand that regardless of what you're going through today, I'm praying that the same power that God used when he raised Jesus from the dead, he will use to raise you from whatever death it is that you're experiencing today. And the fact of the matter is that God wants us to experience that. And so here's the question. The question, ladies and gentlemen, is if we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, then why would we ever live like he is still in the grave? If we believe what we sang a moment ago, that up from the grave he arose, then why would we ever continue to live as though he is still dead? And maybe the way to answer that question is by asking two others. Maybe the way to answer that is by asking two other questions. The first simply being, am I a Christian in theory or am I a Christian in reality? Am I a Christian only in what I do on Sunday when I when I look good and I sing the songs and pray the prayers and everything's fine, but then I got to walk out the door. What about, what about then? Or, or how about this question? Do I believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a sufficient power to make a tangible, meaningful difference in my life? That's the question. That's the question. In John chapter 20 and beginning of verse 15, there's an interesting statement in the narrative that is so often overlooked Mary sees a figure and can't identify who it is. And Jesus said to her, woman, why, why are you weeping? Who do you seek? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said, I'm seeking my Lord. Tell me where you've taken him. I'll go. I'll retrieve his body. I'll take care of him. But I want you to notice a statement. She supposed him to be the gardener. We don't ever think about that. I want you to think about that this morning. She supposed that he was the gardener. I want to tell you this morning, he was the gardener and he is the gardener. I mean, we're, we think about Jesus and we say, well, Jesus was a, he was the teacher. He was a rabbi. He was, he was a carpenter. He was Lord. He was all those things. There's no doubt about that. But I want to tell you that he was also the gardener because gardeners live, deal with living things. And Jesus said, I am come that a man might have life and that he might have it more abundantly to this very day. Jesus is turning graves into gardens. He is bringing life from death. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, graves are inevitable. Let's not miss that this morning. 
We don't need to try to bury that, sweep it under the rug. We need to be honest about that. Graves are inevitable. To paraphrase Oprah, you get to die, you get to die, you get to die, you get to die. We all get to die. Graves are inevitable. Maybe that's the death of a dream or the death of a marriage, or the death of a friendship, or the death of hope, or the death of your soul, certainly one day it will be the death of your physical self. But Jesus' story doesn't end on a cross, and yours doesn't have to either. Because the resurrection means that your failures are not final. There are countless people sitting in this room today who have experienced that personally, relationally, spiritually, and physically. People who have made the trip from the grave to the garden. Because the fact of the matter is that every person in this room of of age, at least, of any age, has been nailed to their own personal cross, and they've been sealed to their own personal tomb. And yet here they are today. Jesus made sure. Jesus made sure regarding his resurrection that his disciples could experience that celebration. And so he made it a point over the next several weeks that he would appear to multiple people in multiple venues with multiple witnesses. They saw him, they touched him, they ate with him. On one occasion, he met with over 500 of his brethren at once. He did all of that that led up, that led up to the time just a few weeks later in Acts chapter 2 when the apostles would preach a simple three-point lesson on Pentecost. And their three points would be these. Number one, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you. He was proven by God, by miracles and signs and wonders, to be in fact God in the flesh. He was the Messiah for whom you had been looking. Point number two, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men put him to death. You have killed God. You put to death the Messiah who came to redeem you. Point number three, God raised him from the dead, from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep hold of him. And so Jesus was God's son. You crucified him. The power of God brought him back to life. Now, they may not have understood everything that you and I understand today because we've got the big picture. We've got the complete story you hold in your hands this morning. You hold the completed story of the Gospels and the Epistles. But they understood this much. They understood that Jesus had been crucified and buried and he rose from the dead. And if a man could walk out of his own grave, then he was who he said that he was. Why does that matter? It matters, ladies and gentlemen, because if graves are inevitable, then we need a plan. If graves are inevitable, we need a plan to deal with our grave, especially spiritually. Because what did we say a moment ago out of Romans 6 and 23? The wages of sin is death. And so if graves are inevitable, if the grave that brings us death spiritually is inevitable because all have sinned, then we've got to have a plan to deal with that. And so later... In that sermon on Pentecost, here's what Peter said. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified. God has made him Lord in Christ. And when they heard that, they were cut to their heart and they said to Peter and the radiator of the apostles, what, what, what should we do? And the answer was, You've got to repent. You've got to repent of this horrible wrong that you have done. And every single one of you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And you'll receive the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you know that story, you know that on that day, 3,000 individuals baptized. And the celebration began. Because there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents, Jesus said. In all of that, we find ourselves in that circumstance. 
John would say that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but the sins of the whole world. That's you and that's me. And again, the point of that is that our failures are not final. Our failures don't have to define or defeat us. Have you ever heard somebody say, you ask somebody how they're doing, how you do it? You ever heard somebody answer, you know what? I'd have to die to get better. Usually we're talking about some physical illness. You feel so bad, I'd, I'd have to die to get better. You know what, spiritually, that's exactly right. Spiritually, we've got to die. We've got to die to get better. That baptism that we read about a moment ago in, in Acts chapter 2, you, you, every one of you need to repent and to be baptized. That's what baptism is. Baptism is a death to sin and self. It is a burial in a grave of water. It is rising to walk in newness of life. That's a great statement out of Romans 6 and beginning to verse 4, that we rise to walk in newness of life. Maybe you've been in a grave of broken promises or broken vows or a broken heart or a broken soul. You don't have to live in the past and you don't have to live in fear of the future. Because when you're a Christian, it's not just that you're still the old person who's just trying hard to do better. It is that you're a new creation in Christ. And now... You have that resurrection power of God that he wants to use in your life. Newness of life. Paul put it this way, Galatians 2, and beginning to verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. you got to die to get better. I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who listen to the language. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. We sing a song in our churches. Because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Bring it on. I can face anything because Ephesians 1, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, God is willing to use in the answer to my prayer. Bring it on. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. As the psalmist said, what can man do to me? Because he lives, life is worth the living. Because greater, John said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The key to all of it is Romans 6 and beginning in verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with Christ in baptism. Like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Not just a resurrected life on Easter Sunday morning, but a resurrected life on Monday at work, and Tuesday at school, and Wednesday at home, and Thursday at the rec center, and Friday and Saturday, and then again, and then again on Sunday. Because Jesus came back to life so that he could give us life so that we can live a life of hope. How about you in this morning? You know, maybe, maybe you're here this morning because somebody invited you to come and, and, and honestly, maybe all this is just kind of brand new to you. Could I just say, first of all, thank you so much for being here. It's hard to walk into a room of hundreds of people that you don't know. That can be intimidating. So just thank you for being here. Thank you for listening so carefully this morning. We'd like to study the Bible with you. If you're, if you're interested in that, see, see me afterwards this morning. We'd love to study the Bible with you and help you maybe understand a little more about what we discussed this morning. But maybe you're in this audience this morning and you've been thinking about these kinds of things for a long time because this is the environment in which you've grown. Or you've been talking and thinking about this or studying about this with somebody else. Could I just say to you, there would never, ever be a better time, a better day, a better opportunity to begin to walk in newness of life than today. And so if today is the day that you know that you need to be buried in baptism, buried in baptism so that you can rise to life or come home to your father so that your life can be renewed then this invitation is for you let's stand and let's sing
good morning to all of you. In just a second, we'll have a song and a prayer. We'll be dismissed. But before we do, I have just a few announcements for you. Uh, first of all, if you're visiting with us here today, we're so grateful, so grateful that you could be here. And we pray that, as Matthew said at the beginning, you'll, you'll stick around. You'll let us get a chance to meet you. Or maybe that was Ethan. I'm sorry. Uh, either way, either way, stick around. Let us get a chance to meet you. If, uh, if you're new to us, we'd love to welcome you warmly here. Uh, and, and this evening at 5, we're going to meet together again for Bible study. And uh, we have four tremendous Bible classes. We have a college class going upstairs, and we have uh, classes for kids of all ages. So if you want to be a part of that, you'd like to study the Bible more with us, we invite you to come back at 5 p.m. We'll be right here. Uh, also, if you have a family report, just want to make mention of two things. On the front, obviously, you'll see uh, the invitation for our teen weekend, which starts on April 29th. Make sure that if you have a teen, uh, you tell them about that, get them there. Uh, they'll definitely be benefited by being a part of our teen weekend. And then our new adult classes are going to start. You'll see that on the inside on May 1st. So make sure you're ready for that new change in classes. Uh, we'll meet together tonight at 5. We'll probably have some more updates for you then. But for now, let's have a song and prayer and be dismissed. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for this wonderful day, another day of life that we can um, gather here with our church family and worship you. We thank you for all the many blessings that you've given to us, and um, we hope as we go through the rest of this week that we would um, remember that you're alive and that we are living for you. Help us to encourage those around us to seek you and to find you. Help us to live like you and give us courage to be bold in your word. Help us to trust that you will bring us out of darkness and that you will always be there for us. Help us to submit to you and remember that you are the almighty and all powerful and um, help us do your will and do what you need us to do. And um, we trust that you would give us what you know we need so that we can continue to encourage those around us and Make sure that we are shining lights and setting an example. Forgive us of our sins and um, keep, us, keep us safe as we go through this week and encourage us to continue to be bold in your word and um, live like you as we, we shine lights. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.